and for yes. everybody who entered into our uh, discussion period. So feel free to chime in, everyone. Well, can you hear me now? Yes, yes sir. I've been trying to, to preach this for a long time to folks for many years. We, we cannot hardly simulate here on Earth what's going to happen on the moon. But over and, above, over and above that, gosh, guys, we've got to get in front of NASA people and share this information you've told today because it's a real hazard to the astronauts to go back up there and spend any extended long length of time and get exposed to the dust. We need to have suit covers We need or, and or leave the suits outside. We need to have airlocks, which will, would help us. We need to get serious about this. And I'm not getting good response from NASA folks up to, up to date. It's a point well taken, Ron. The, the, the dust uh, problem, as you know, was something that the Apollo missions were aware of, uh, but they didn't do anything to mitigate it. They just tolerated it. And, but because those missions were a very short duration, uh, the total dose exposure was, was limited. And so now there's a fair number of, of efforts going into, as we've heard in, in this series of, of, of talks, technologies that are designed to remove dust from surfaces uh, to uh, potentially passivate uh, uh, airborne dusts through a variety of different techniques uh, inside a habitat and or through using a variety of different engineering controls. But you're correct in that they're clearly, uh, this problem is not going away. And uh, this is not just something that we're gonna be experiencing on the moon. If humans go to Mars, uh, we will be experiencing it there and on uh, astro uh, asteroids as well. So the dust problem is sort of ubiquitous wherever humans are gonna be exploring. And I agree with you that uh, there, there needs to be a concerted effort in uh, looking at the in situ nature of these materials because of the exotic nature of the lunar environment and seeing how that compares to what samples we have here on Earth. And what we might learn is that there's a big difference and that the permissible exposure limits might need to be revised. On the other hand, we might learn that uh, our permissible exposure limits that were developed for from Apollo 14 specimens were is pretty close to what we expect in various different locations. But my I would wager to bet that uh, there's going to be natural variability from site to site on the moon, as we have heard throughout the conference of how um, varied the surface is and the chemistry of the material there is going to have a large impact on technology and biology. I, 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 can't, I can't fully agree with you. I mean, we've got to keep the dust away from the astronaut's lungs. You, uh, the way you do that is you keep the dust outside. I, I keep bounding on people. You can't bring the dust inside the habitat. They commented on Apollo 16, Charlie Duke shared that uh, they got back inside, they kept their suits on because the, the dust was getting so bad that when they docked with the command module, the, uh, uh, the poor fellow automatically had to bring a, a vacuum in there and try to get rid of it, but it still exposed their lungs to the, to the dust. And it was a short duration EVAs, so uh, maybe 20 hours outside the uh, exposed. It's, it's, we've got to get everybody really attuned to this. This is a major issue. I would agree, it's not going away. Um, Doug or anybody else in, in the panel, uh, do you have anything to add or uh, contribute to uh, Ron's points. Yeah, I, I would be uh, interested to know if any of those new studies would change the threshold that we currently have for the exposure, uh, consider safe exposure. Yeah. I don't think there's any such thing as safe <laughs> exposure to lunar yeah. dust. Safety. <laughs> there's, there's no safe exposure. You've shown that in these presentations up to up, up today. It clearly has a, a biological effect. Uh, and in my opinion, limiting that exposure to as little as possible. Uh, and if we can completely eliminate it, that's the best scenario. I, I would totally agree. Okay. Yeah. I know there are systems for like, um, like monitoring people's radiation risks over time. Um, 
like in space environments and otherwise, maybe there's, you know, there has to be a similar metric where it's like, yeah, obviously nobody wants to get irradiated at all, but like, like when do we start like ringing all the alarm bells? Um, after like a certain amount of dust exposure, like that'd probably be really useful. On, Donald, on the Apollo, I to, oh, sorry, go ahead. On the Apollo landings, we got very lucky. There were no solar flares during the time that the Apollo missions occurred. If there'd been a solar flare, <laughs> we might have we might have gotten a severe exposure of a whole lot of bad things on the moon. Not to mention the micrometeorites. I saw some presentations yesterday that showed high densities of uh, micrometeorite exposure. Uh, but let's, let's get back to the lunar dust. Keep it out of the astronauts' lungs. Yeah, uh, uh, this is Tom Orlando. And we have a program in that in our uh, Reveals Survey Center. Uh, one thing I want to point out is, in addition to these important studies that were just discussed, a significant fraction of the dust, which isn't isn't studied, is in the nanometer size regime. The yeah. na nanometer size particles are the ones that are uh, taken up uh, rather immediately, and they're not monitored. And those are known to have massive toxic effects uh, here on Earth even. So I think it's a bigger problem than these um, uh, talks demonstrate because the, uh, the toxicity of the nanometer particles are, 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 are really high. Yeah, I would agree with that. And you know, anywhere between five to 10, 20% of the lunar surface or 15 or so of that material is respirable in, in nature. And as you accurately point out, there's there clearly are uh, increasing toxicity effects as the particle size gets smaller. Uh, there was somebody about to jump in uh, there. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to make a quick comment. Yeah, that, please, Don, Donald, yes. Yeah, that anything below like one micron can very, very easily just be absorbed by the circulatory and nervous systems. And, you know, that can settle even into the brain. And I think there was a study, it wasn't lunar related, but they found that high levels of magnetite in the brain through air pollution uh, led to Alzheimer's or led to a higher chance of Alzheimer's. So, you know, people are up on the moon, you know, for you know, months and months, you know, I think they're going for six months or something with, with Artemis, if I'm not mistaken. And I think the next Artemis mission later in the decade is supposed to be longer than that. So, you know, I mean, you want to try and protect these people from, you know, not succumbing to these sort of long-term diseases, like potentially, you know, I don't think there's any magnetite on the moon. But if you're having, you know, lunar dust grains settling into your brain, you know, that could lead to many other diseases, neuro neurological diseases, you know, later on in life. So that's something that needs to be looked at. And I don't think many people have really tried to find ways to mitigate, you know, the smallest particles. Everyone, you know, is looking at particles less than 25 microns, less than 10 microns. But what about less than one micron, less than half a micron? You know, that's still pretty prevalent on the moon. That was what I was like had a question about, I didn't realize that the nanometer particles, I, I just missed that it wasn't being accounted for, I guess. Um, like, are, are there even masks or filters that can filter nanometer size particles? The filters can, I think down to 300 nanometers, but I think there's studies that have done that there's dust particles smaller than that, down yeah. to like 100 or even 50. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's for sure. And actually this is a huge issue right now for indoor air quality for COVID transmission. Right. It's I think the best thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I hope you could take that. This the session organizers can take a summary here forward to somebody uh, to come out of this conference with some kind of positive way of getting people attuned to the fact that you've got to get the lungs, keep the lungs clear of this, and the lungs, lungs just going to transmit it into the brain, into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So, um, let me point out something. So there is a, a pretty big effort here on Earth to uh, deal with getting rid of these sub 300 nanometer size particles for the indoor air quality issues associated with COVID. Mm -hmm. These technologies um, can easily and should be adapted to habitats in space. Um, NASA, NASA did extensive work on uh, suit covers uh, at uh, ILC Dover and as well as uh, significant studies on airlocks at NASA Ames. And uh, I see some hope that uh, Elon Musk's big vehicle qu quotes a couple of airlocks. So we'll see. <laughs> There's definitely uh, suit lock technologies and these kinds of things that are in development. 
Uh, and and I, I like that operational approach to, to keep, keep the dust out. So I have a question on that. I mean, so you're gonna need to have some kind of a diagnostic probe to determine whether or not you kept the sub 300 nanometer particles out. Yeah. You know, you can't use the scattering technique very well with this size particle. So is there is there some technology that's being developed to, to show how good the airlocks are? Yeah, how, how, how are we gonna be able to sample the air or surfaces uh, in future missions of what dust may be present that we can't see. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, does anybody else? Yeah, I don't think that's really possible. I mean, probably I don't know it, but like, because I, I also have read some papers about air pollution and it's also like remain a hard issue to like deal with those nanoparticles inside, like inside our air, like, when you're living near factory or stuff, it's just, it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Hmm. You could take one of those uh, COVID filters and, you know, suck air through it for five minutes and then see how dirty it got. <laughs> I'm not an engineer, by the way. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I really, yeah, I was kind of thinking that to uh, Tom about how we've just had all of this research happen very rapidly about like COVID and transmission of really tiny particles that are very difficult to manage through the air. Um, so, I mean, I mean the best way. So we develop we're developing technologies for this for um, indoor air venues, and and uh, one of the better ways of doing it is. Um, is related to one of the talks where you um, you have field emission of slow electrons and you electrostatically precipitate these out, and you and you collect them electrically, right? And you and you and you, you basically have a, a you know an electrostatic cleaner. Um, you got to have good thr throughput um, in the indoor air, but um, there's ways of designing that for that to work. Yeah, and another interesting point too is that. Uh, obviously, nobody's going to be exposed to material that's, you know, out on the lunar surface. It's only going to be inside spacesuits or in a habitat. And uh, if that respirable size material gets into the atmosphere, it can, it can stay lofted in a reduced gravity environment in that uh, atmosphere in a habitat for extended periods. So this is another uh, topic to be considering as we're developing, you know, future follow-on missions and habitats and so on. I might jump in just for a second. Um, I've worked with some particulate matter analysis people and uh, in measuring dust particles in atmosphere that can go down to 10 nanometer size. Um, it's not a scattering uh, technique, but it, it can measure particles down that size and get particle size distributions. Um, but they do have scattering techniques that get to about 100 nanometers in size. So it is possible to measure these size ranges. What, what kind of, uh, Jeff, what kind of device was that or, or technique? I, I'm familiar with uh, a sort of a bench top microtrack or blue wave microtrack that uh, you know, can measure particle size using me scattering uh, whether in air or in a liquid vehicle? So uh, one is a, I believe it's called a Grim instrument uh, as the company, and it uses laser scattering on single particles in a flow. So you could use that in a habitat. Um, then there's also electrostatic classifiers and you can um, parse out grain size by their you know, size, electric charge interactions. And for the really small grain size, what you do is you actually end up growing it um, in a, a solution and you know you know how much it's grown and then you can go back to its original size so you can do it that way too. I forget what that's called. I'm wondering if any of the other panelists uh, have other thoughts uh, on this topic like for example Ben uh, was developing technologies to remove material from surfaces you know maybe through the, his lenses uh, or the other participants have some more ideas. Is there anyone 
uh, any of the other speakers that might want to chime in? Well, yeah, so we, we've been developing this technologies for COVID and we also have a project for NASA and they're, and they're, they're basically going in parallel. Um, there's actually an electrostatic glove that the students at Georgia Tech are putting together. Um, where you can electrostatically brush off stuff uh, and, and it would be a tool that the, the uh, astronauts use uh, to brush themselves off before they get into the uh, antechamber. Uh, but all of these are basically um, due to nucleation and growth and, and, and charging of the grains and, and sort of, you know, ut utilizing the sort of the electrostatics to get rid of them. Um, so they're just sort of removed but not destroyed. I challenge folks that all of this is wasted housekeeping time. It's, it's, it's wasted science time in housekeeping. Sure, I agree. By the way, we did an awful lot of that on the moon. We, we when it all was over with the, with the rovers, got them, the final rover back there, we sat there and we, we said, my gosh, we have made the astronauts try to brush off the dust, which didn't work even though it had been shown before the missions that it would work here on earth, didn't work on the moon. Uh, and they, they were very frustrated. I can send you all the two minute video that was made using the TV camera of Charlie Duke and John Young trying to clean it off their suits. Uh, whether so, a wand, electrostatic wand would have helped, who knows? Uh, it's just awfully dirty up there. They also, I want to point out to y'all, the dust does not stay on the moon. The dust can be pro propelled up into orbit around the moon. There are studies that there's considerable uh, dust can be up there in the gateway, getting toward the gateway. Uh, hopefully we won't ingest it there. So, so I have a question um, which is related to your comment about dusting off. So we, we philosophically don't buy into that either. Um, so uh, Zach Siebers uh, gave a talk and, the, and, the, and the, the reason for making these um, conductive uh, polymers is to put a laminate on the suit where you can electrostatically repel the dust and therefore you're sort of actively removing them. So I guess I would like to hear from some other folks whether or not they think that's a, that's a, a, a good idea and a viable pathway. I mean, that's pretty similar to the research that I've been doing, you know, using, using the conductive nature of the dust just to try and, you know, electrically repel it from whatever surface you, you're concerned about. Um, so I mean, like what you said about the electrostatic glove and you know covering your 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 suit or whatever in the in the electrostatic material. That's that's all stuff that I've heard about, and it seems like very very good method to keep the dust off of um, off the astronauts and out of the out of the actual habitat. I I had seen some demonstrations down at KSC a number of years ago that were very visually convincing of, the, of, of this type of technology and the ability to move it off a surface. It's not 100% efficient as you've pointed out in your studies, but I personally, if we can develop that into you know, the, the hardware and have it be part of the operational scenario where we just try to keep it off all the time, we're gonna be in a better shape uh, in the long run. It's awfully, it's awfully pervasive. If you've seen astronauts, I had somebody suggest to me, well, we'll have the astronauts move around slower so they don't fall down. That's it. That doesn't work, guys. They're going to fall <laughs> and uh, uh, they're going to be immersed in it, covered with the stuff. Yep. Yep. And places yeah. where they can't, places where they can't reach around. You can't reach unless your buddy does it for you. I mean, I think the main thing is we are going to have to use multiple different techniques to, to clean off different things, right? I mean, my group and I, we've talked about making a handheld dust mitigation device that the astronauts could take with them to, to clean off, you know, devices and tools and stuff outside of the, of the habitat. But we've also talked about, you know, we're going to need an airlock with some sort of dust mitigation system inside of it. I've also talked to other folks that are working on... Uh, developing like films and materials that the dust just doesn't stick to in the first place. And that would be something they could apply to like camera lenses or, you know, thermal panels, things like that, so that we don't even have to worry about mitigating it. So we're gonna, I, I think we're just gonna have to do a, a bunch of different things because, you know, a handheld device doesn't work for everything. An airlock doesn't work for everything. A film doesn't work for everything, but the point is to keep the dust from coming into the, into the habitat.
at all. Yeah, that's a good point. You wouldn't want to have anything woven necessarily if you're, if you're trying to do that. Maybe. Right, and you know, part of one thing to consider is also the cost. That's why that's why we my group is actually pretty pretty interested in having an external electron beam source that we can use to clean things off rather than an integrated um, electrostatic system because that just makes the cost of production you know skyrocket. Yeah. In, in addition to the um, pulmonary effects, uh, as everyone knows, the the um, you know finest fraction of lunar material is highly abrasive. And it's, it's very um, abrasive to, you know, suit surfaces, anything that articulates or moves, it can jam it up. Uh, we did do a handful of studies that looked at uh, skin abrasion and uh, at ocular effects uh, when that is in the eye, when it, if you get it in your eye. And there's different things that we need to be considering on how you know, we're going to be washing the eyes out uh, when when you get it in your in your face by accident. Um, we also need to be considering what kind of garments we may want to uh, have against our body, uh, because the, as we learned from some of our abrasive, abrasion studies, the type of, of 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 garment that was worn either you know increased or reduced the abrasive nature of of the dust that we introduced in the in the study. Turns out uh, cotton actually seems to create a, a better uh, a boundary to reduce abrasion against a astronauts or against a simulated skin. But again, you know, this is just one example of a number of possible ways to mitigate these effects. Well, uh, Doug. Yeah, I, I would say that. Uh... We have some uh, also chats here. Uh, uh, Ian Wells uh, was saying about uh, some development about liquid nitrogen to remove dust. So Ian, if you want to uh, include that in the conversation here, you feel free to unmute yourself and also share. Yeah. Um... I sent the uh, poster in the chat. Um, I didn't know about this conference until a few weeks ago. Um, so I presented that poster at the cryogenic engineering conference, but uh, we've had very good removal uh, just in kind of ambient conditions uh, with liquid nitrogen. Um, it uses the Leiden frost effect uh, and a few other um, effects that we are still figuring out. Um, but we've had very good removal and we're planning on doing testing in a vacuum chamber very soon. Um, it doesn't mitigate the very, very small particles that uh, you all have been talking about. Um, but for everything uh, pretty much over three microns, we are confident that uh, it's able to mitigate them. Have you told the folks at Johnson that you're considering blowing, them, uh, blowing a nitrogen gas by their suits? Uh, we did get funded by the uh, Big Idea Challenge. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember which uh, center that's through. Suits, suits, are, suits are a spacecraft, and we had to be very, very careful. We didn't tear them or damage them in any way. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, one of the things that we are definitely looking into is how the uh, treatment affects the uh, spacesuit material. So far, uh, we don't have any, um, we, we haven't uh, visibly seen any uh, degradation of the suit material, but we haven't extensively looked at it yet. I just had a vision of the astronauts being required to put a mask on with a filtration system for the, all the time that they're inside the habitat after they've been out on the moon. That's another idea. I like it. So I guess sort of a general question, what would take priority in between now and the Artemis mission? Would it be understanding the toxic and chemical pathways of lunar dust toxicity or trying to mitigate the dust? Well, I think 
Um, we, we, that's a great question, mm -hmm. Donald. It, it, it seems like um, keeping it out might be a, a, an easier problem, at least at, at first glance, but uh, although technologically that might be very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, if we're thinking about using medical interventions to uh, reduce the biological effects, I think that might be further off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what that would be. So unless there's some kind of chelating agent or a, a iron scavenger or the like, um, as you pointed out, some of these particles that are extremely small can cross the blood brain, brain barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a whole area of, of, of much needed study too. And I would, I would predict, and I, I'm not familiar with that literature, but there may be a body of literature that's out there that sort of discusses a lot of that as it relates to other kinds of of uh, fine grain dusts. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I mean, if I, if like understanding the toxic pathways is important, then you know, then having like an in situ sort of like rover on the lunar surface would probably be the best option. And trying to find ways to sort of you know send like these cells to be exposed to this dust and sort of see you know what very very fresh lunar regolith has on the effect on uh, living tissues or living cells compared to, you know, trying to spend so much time and effort, you know, trying to replicate lunar dust here on Earth. Yep. I, my, my, in my opinion, the most interesting questions uh, that need to be addressed is the interaction of planetary dusts with life from Earth. Mm -hmm. And because we're, we, we can't avoid it, it's going to happen. And if we can develop some uh, small pathfinder-like experiments that um, will expose, as you pointed out, model organisms to, to dust in the lunar environment. It's going to help us better understand uh, both short and uh, acute and potentially chronic effects of short and long duration uh, missions. And the same thing holds true for, I mean, we we're talking about the moon, but uh, on Mars, you know, in parts per million uh, exists perchlorates that are known toxic uh, uh, chemically reactive uh, hyperchlorates. So um, if we can start doing this kind of work on the moon, it's going to help us prepare for future exploration elsewhere. And I, I think it's something we really need to do. And perhaps we can take a step through a, you know, a, you know, a prism uh, uh, call to begin to explore this and maybe follow on missions. Yeah, definitely. I agree. It's just a I think we better get some masks ready for these first few crews. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the best option, honestly, for yeah. if we can find ways to mitigate, that's going to be the best option. Just, you know, yep. give them a mask and maybe by the next mission, we'll have it better figured out. Yep. And what would be really interesting uh, would be to sample, you know, what is captured by the masks and what is not captured if you if there's a way to to build in that kind of control. Mm -hmm. And that this will then tell us more about the occupational exposure these individuals in the lunar environment are actually, you know, experiencing. So I, I really like this idea of wearing masks. I, I it's it's a great idea. Now this might be a little bit broader than just the uh, lunar dust because there's a lot of talk about doing in situ 3D manufacturing. And in the 3D manufacturing process, even though there's good containment, there's always small particles that escape. And so just in the manufacturing process, you may be generating toxic particles that also should, should be, you should be protecting against. Exactly. Yeah, I think the big, that's one of the big take homes here is uh, what's the way we can uh, routinely sample the, the atmosphere of a habitat for any airborne particulates and the use of masks potentially as a mitigation strategy uh, when in the habitat. Um, what are some others? These are great ideas. I mean, like, uh, it's probably more unrealistic. I've heard other people bring this up, like a shower, but I mean, you have to get all the water up there first. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. Yep. John, you said something about uh, heating increases radical production. Is that, I, I was typing a response in the chat at that point, and I missed that. Um, is, is 
uh, was it uh, heat was increasing? No, it was, so the metallic iron, we pretty much formed it on the surface by running the stream of hydrogen gas and then heating the uh, sample up so the iron can more easily reduce. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't, well, I think, well, I mean, I've read other papers where, you know, you can raise the uh, temperature up to a certain point, you do get more OH radical. So it's just possible that in human body temperature, you get a bit more, but no, the uh, heating in my talk was just trying to reduce the samples or getting taken on iron on the surface. Okay. Well, we're, I think we're well over the discussion uh, period limit here. Yes. Um, <laughs> but it's, this is really interesting uh, that as many folks have hung in uh, on this discussion period and clearly it's uh, pointing to the fact, in my opinion, that this is a really important topic and that uh, the evidence that and data that has been presented, you know, lends itself to an important uh, uh, area of current and future research needs for both, you know, current and future uh, missions on the moon. And so uh, I would invite any and all of you to stay in contact with myself and, and Doug and every, all the other panelists to uh, figure out ways that we can potentially work together to begin to address some of these really important topics. Yeah, absolutely. I agree completely with you. And I, I think we had the opportunity to reflect about the importance of not only mitigate dust, but trying to work around of some aspects to reduce toxicity and the damage that can cause on humans. Yeah. Thank you, you all. Yeah.